Are hey, y'all ready to get this started? Three, two, one. Hey, y'all know what time it is. You know what it is. You are now tuning into the best business radio program in Central VA. Turn it up. On the mic with Mike. On WJFM Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to On the Mic with Mike. Mike King here. Uh, the program is On the Mic with Mike. ESPN Richmond is where we are, as well as The Choice, as well as... Uh, uh, International Business Growth Radio. I'm here, this is our monthly summit, I'm here with my man Chris Mayfield. He is here and we're, we offer nonprofits an opportunity to operate uh, what they do and operate in a more, in a, I guess in a better manner. We give them information. So this week we are here at Mama Shell's Cafe who is our sponsor for the series. Welcome, I mean, what am I saying welcome to you? Jeff Michelle Wilson here. <laughs> and we are here at Cafe. Let folks know who you are and what you do. Okay, well, I'm Chef Michelle of Mama Shell's Cafe, located at 1011 Hull Street Road here in Melothian. Uh, we have a TV show. We have the parking lot pull-up. I'm glad to partner with Mike. We've been doing this for some years now. And these fine men and women that are here, Chris. So I'm Don't glad to be a it. part of it. I know, right? I'm so she has a TV show, and it, it just tapes. The name of the show is? Oh, the name of the show is The Culture Mix Experiment. And yes. it can be found on, where? It can be found on streaming channels on Roku, Apple, and Fire Stick TV. Right? And it's is called that right? Taste on TV. On Taste on TV. There you go. Channels. Yes. Alrighty, so thank you for having us. Really quickly, i got to give a shout out to things. This is like my NASCAR Open here. i got to give a shout out to my good friends over at the Foreign Exchange for the gear. Uh, there's, some, there's some great uh, designers who are out there doing some really cool things in the community. As well as uh, Jay Carpenter, Hanley Watches. Got to show some love. It's the holiday season. Make sure you go check out Jay Carpenter and Hanley Watches. Really quickly turn over to Chris Mayfield. He's going to talk a little bit about what we do. And then we're going to introduce our friend, uh, Kristen Cooper, who owns Pearl's Nutrition. She's here with the uh, Healthy Drinks, which is my favorite. <laughs> there you go, Chris Mayfield. All right. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for, uh, for uh, coming and sharing uh, your time as you do so generously uh, every time. Uh, we're happy uh, that we're able to provide this opportunity for you to broadcast your message over radio, over social media. Uh, the, I have a personal belief that nonprofits are the, the connective tissue between businesses and people inside a community and that uh, uh, businesses uh, can, should, and have a responsibility uh, to support nonprofits in their community because it, it makes the community that you operate in uh, that you do your work in uh, better, uh, which raises the uh, quality of life for all of us. So uh, uh, really appreciate you being here this morning. Uh, I look forward to a lively uh, conversation. Uh, if you are listening or, or watching a snip and you miss any or you just really want to uh, hear it all again, uh, you can go to my website, perfusion-consulting.com, and, and catch the entire program there. Or uh, uh, give me a call and I'll be happy to send it to you, 757-373-3109. Chris Mayfield is a B Corp. That means he gives away all the money that he makes outside of what it takes to run his business. Right. That, that's, a, that's a very big thing. And we got to give a shout out to our man over there who's sponsoring us. Dustin. Du okay, yeah, so real Dustin quickly, when, it's, when we're going to go through it, you guys are going to tell me you do. Dustin Yancey from Bankers Life is the guy who sponsored this right here. As always say, it ain't free. Uh, changing the world, and we need guys like him out there so he can talk about his retirement needs, all the things he does. He's an expert in the field. But up next, Dr. Chris Cooper. How are you? Hey, Mike. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you all today. So my name is Dr. Chris Coop, um, and I have some energy drinks for you. Now, we oftentimes get the question of what's in your energy drinks. So ours are B12, so it's going to give you that natural energy. I'm also a doula. I help mommies deliver babies naturally, and our yeah. products are healthy for mommies to take. And our products are also healthy once a baby starts consuming table food. They can also have our products as well. We have two different flavors for you. We have the Blue Lagoon, and we also have the Cherry Limeade. Blue Lagoon is going to be like your blueberry limeade connotation, kind of, of course, the Cherry Limeade. We are located, Pearl's Nutrition is located at um, Victoria Square Park in um, Plaza. Um, 10835 Hull Street Road. And we don't just offer um, energy drinks, we also have meal replacement smoothies and shakes. And so our shakes are 200 grams, um, 24 grams of protein with 200 calories. Um, and they're going to keep you nice and full. And people are like, wait a second, they're healthy. 
We have so many cheap flavors you wouldn't even realize. For example, chocolate caramel cheesecake. And as we're starting to get into the holidays, we have a gingerbread cookie. Um, one of my favorites is probably the Oreo peanut butter cheesecake. Uh, but then our deluxe strawberry cheesecake is really good. But then this morning I had the salted caramel chocolate. So I mean it just kind of keeps going. And then we also do special recognition days. So like we have Military Mondays, we have Teacher Tuesdays, Wellness Wednesdays, Thirsty Thursdays, and then we have First Responder Fridays. So when they come in they get a little extra discount because we want to thank those individuals who are out there on the front line. So if you guys would like I can go ahead and pass these out to you and then you guys can get started with the intro. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. One of the great things Chris Coop has also has in and we have a like we got a gym teacher in the house. <laughs> Lovely. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Physical, physical education. education. She's so much and more. So much and more. so much more. And so much more. Okay, so we're gonna go through. I always, always like everybody loves the the physical teacher uh, because they're a cool person <laughs> in the school. They are. So they, they, they are. They really cool. are. <laughs> they're a cool person. Alrighty, so what Chris is gonna pass these out. Then we're gonna get started with some intros. We talk about you know a little brief intro what you're gonna do. Uh, the next going to talk about the fundraising side, uh, that right, the, all things that can help. Uh, Chris Mayfield is going to talk a little bit about the processes. We're going to talk about how you how do you get a media exposure to help you set yourself aside apart from all the other nonprofits who are out there. There's only so many, so much time and energy and dollars to go around. You got to get yours, and so what we're here to help you do is make sure that that happens. All righty. Uh, so, uh, we're going to start. Dustin Yancey, tell us about Banker's Life really quickly. Oh, hi, I'm Dustin Yancey with Banker's Life. Um, we just opened an office in Charlottesville. So, I'm a local retirement planner for Charlottesville and Richmond. Anything from uh, people who have disabilities to folks that are turning 65 and trying to hit the five points that come along with it. <laughs> Unfortunately, anything that the government does makes it very complicated, and I'm here to just paint an easy picture in the process. But I like to say you ride in a Cadillac off into retirement and not hit all the speed bumps because it's got a level ride. So at the end of the of my uh, sitting down with you, you're comfortable and you understand the process. So contact information. Oh yeah, uh, you can reach me on my cell phone at uh, 434 981 3419 or at dustin.yancey at bankerslife.com. Before we go on, amazing. Thank you. This is delicious. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Please you do so much. much. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. And we're located just right over there, so if you guys would like to try a smoothie, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was just thinking. <laughs> Grab lunch and wait. Yeah, uh, Wednesday tradition. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you, Chris. All right, we're going to go down through the, the list, tell folks who you are, what you're doing, and then we're going to get into the meat of why we're here. Sure, shall I begin? Um, <clears throat> hello, I am Carolyn Seaman. I am Director of Development with Richmond Behavioral Health Foundation. So we are the 501c3 nonprofit arm of Richmond Behavioral Health. Uh, so we uh, support Richmond Behavioral Health Authority um, with funding and with resource development. At Richmond Behavioral Health Authority um, provides um, behavioral health services, so from mental health, substance use, um, developmental uh, disabilities to the citizens of Richmond. Um, we serve low income and no income uh, individuals and families, and about 30% of those we serve do not have any insurance or means to pay for treatment, but we will not turn anyone away um, for inability to pay. I'm Stephanie Becker, uh, the co-founder and executive director of Better Together. We are a local nonprofit that provides support services and resource coordination to families of children with rare and complex medical illnesses. Sounds complicated, and it, their illnesses are. But the population we address is um, the kiddos that fall through the cracks because they have an illness that doesn't have a name you or I recognize. So not cancer, not juvenile diabetes. These are the rare illnesses that may just be one or two in Richmond and don't have a support system. So our job uh, and our mission is to help equip, support, and educate these families on uh, how to care for their kids and provide resources that exist in the community, just reduce the barriers and access to um, the support systems so that they're equipped to care for their, their kids. All right, I'm Heather Pate, uh, registered peer recovery specialist and co-founder for Robin's Hope. Uh, Robin's Hope is here to uh, 
Hold on. I did it again. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just recently changed it. Um, all right. So we are a safe, peer-run community um, for adults that help uh, inspire hope, create, uh, build resilience, and create connections. Sorry about that. But basically, we are free to all, uh, 18 and up, uh, to come in and trauma knows no bounds and many times uh, we don't even realize there's been trauma in our lives but it's still impacting us and so we are a safe space uh, to look at that but also to build resilience and overcome. Hi, I'm Lynn Wingfield. I am the chair of a really new nonprofit called CFIT Community. Um, as Mike had mentioned, um, nonprofits need partnership from businesses, um, but I think a lot of what CFIT community is looking for is um, unification of nonprofits. Um, our goal is a Chesterfield County based nonprofit that looks at resources and assisting everyone who lives, learns, works, worships, or plays in Chesterfield County get them the resources they need. So coming today um, and finding out about all these other awesome nonprofits, uh, whether it's these resources, whether it's things within Chesterfield County, our mental health services, our library services, our parks and rec services, we want to be the bridge that connects people who have questions or have needs. Uh, we want to get them connected to where they are. Hi, I'm Nanette Shore. My company is Shore Fundraising Strategies. And I work with nonprofits to help them raise more money and excel in their fundraising so they can deliver more services to the community. Um, I have been in the nonprofit and the business world for over 35 years, so combining both those um, skills and experiences to help and work with nonprofits on board engagement, fundraising, uh, individual donor cultivation, donor stewardship, kind of whatever they need in the fundraising area. And I just love working with nonprofits in our community to help them really be better at what they're doing and really the, the money is the means to deliver the services. So um, it's not a taboo, it's a good thing and I, um, I love, I won't say I love asking people for money, but I love asking people to support um, our community and the nonprofit. So I'm thrilled to be here with so many wonderful partners. So thank you all for what you do. Thank you. One of the great things about being here is that uh, you guys are in a room with folks who kind of understand the plight that you're in. Let's talk a little bit about coming through COVID and what it means for you guys. Now, what you've seen on the other side, and we're going to get into a little bit of the net with the fundraising, some of, maybe some of the challenges that you guys are having right now as we move through COVID, because it may seem like your message, your problem is all you, only yours, but there's somebody else who's out there who's sharing that same thing. It's kind of like the sharing moment. Mm -hmm. uh, all righty. Uh, Lynn, why don't we start with okay. you? Since you guys are the new ones, correct? Yes, so right. we're the new ones. and. Um, really getting the development started, um, our focus originally was uh, active living types of pieces and we realized several years ago as we were kind of talking through this that physical activity is great, like you said, coming from the physical education teacher there, Mike. Um, <laughs> but this is it. Yes, that, that's, that's, that's just that's don't that's say gym. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You teach in a gym, you don't teach gym. So then I you see. That. see? <laughs> yeah. see Everyone now knows that. <laughs> and we were showing love to the gym Everyone's teacher. Everyone's learned stuff today. Learning a um. to achieve. <laughs> Check. Check. Uh, but as we looked at physical well-being, we really started to understand how everything was really. It's not just physical. It's mental, emotional, environmental, financial, spiritual. You have all of these things. So we really decided to make this very holistic. Um, and we had this idea right as we went into the pandemic. Um, so we, we've had Nanette, thank goodness, um, and we were able to raise some funds. But being brand new and going to businesses and pitching, here's this great idea we have and this is how great it's going to be, but having no history of proving that that's been done, um, is a hard pitch at any point when it's pandemic time and a lot of funds are going to the pieces that are really needed the last couple of years. Um, that's been a struggle for us. Um, the silver lining to what's happened the past couple of years is coming through it, 
we do not have to convince people that their mental health, emotional health, we were, yeah. we were talking about Rob and so forth, how everything is connected. Yeah. Five or ten years ago, that was a hard thing to do. Now it's not. So the, the flip side, the fundraising has been a struggle, um, but we are making strides. But the concept of all of the pieces are connected, your brain, your body, your, your spirit, your everything is connected. So that, we have learned that lesson um, through the last couple of years. So moving forward, it strengthens, ends up strengthening our purpose as we move forward. And I'll just add before you go on, I think what happened in the very beginning is every nonprofit sort of was, was in shock and were wringing their hands and trying to figure out, do I, what I do, does that, is that going to help today, this emergency, this immediate problem? And those who realize that, okay, what they're doing is really important, but it's not feeding people and it's not making sure they have a place to live, um, realized that we're, what they needed to do. And I, I think it took like 30 days for organizations just to sort of figure out where they were. But those that figured out how to, and we all love the word pivot, but how to either pivot or put the message out there appropriately for what was happening have been very, very successful. And m almost all the organizations I've worked with over the last few years figured out how to not be insensitive or going, you know, Linda and go out and ask people for, you know, $10,000 to support this concept that isn't real yet or is in the real stages, but realize how to have the conversations to build the path. And I think everybody did that in their own way. When you were talking, it kind of remind me, we love watching Shark Tank. And, you know, they come up and they say, what do you mean you haven't had any sales? Yeah, I want a million dollars, but I haven't had any sales. Well, there's nothing wrong with being in that position. But you realize that you had to figure out how to make it, excuse me, how to make it um, relevant to the environment. And now people are living in this environment. And I think it's, it, it really bodes well for how our community reacted to um, once we got all got out of the shock of the first 30 days or so. Very quickly, so Nanette, let me ask you, when you, as the expert here funding, when did you start to hear from your people that there may be a way out, that people may see some daylight, and then you guys could chime in and, and sort of say, is that how you saw it? Yeah, I think it happened, like I said, you know, 30 to 60 days when people realized we're not going to survive without doing something. What that something is has to be relevant to the crisis that's going on. Um, and every one of the organizations that at least I work with have an amazing purpose in the community. No one's providing this fluff that doesn't really need to be there. Every nonprofit is doing great work. Um, but when they figured out how to host their gala virtually, that wasn't going to seem insensitive because we're having a gala and people are, you know, trying to figure out how to open their businesses or not open their businesses because they can't. So I would tell you, you know, 30 days to 60 days, people started realizing that there are other ways to do it. There are ways to call their top donors and saying, how are you? Not, I need $10,000 because we've just hit this roadblock that we can't do a, a in person and now we need to set up all the, these kids with virtual opportunities or whatever it was. My goal is to get them to the point that the next time this crisis comes, and we've talked about it, um, they, they can call that donor without having to steward them because they're, they're stewarding them all along. But they can call that donor and say, we're in crisis, I need $10,000, can you help me? So they learn to appropriately reach out. Um, I have donors that when things start to open up a little bit, I mean the nonprofits, they would say to a donor, let's just go for a walk. We're outside, we don't have to be so close. You, when you figure out a way to still keep in touch with people, that's when it turned. And people can um, appreciate what you're doing, but you start with, in crisis like we went through, you start with finding out how those people are. You know, just because they were one of your top donors doesn't mean they're not suffering in some form or fashion. Isolation, financial, children suffering, grandchildren. So I don't think it took long, but I think it took a lot of brain power to, to know what the right thing was to do. And, and each organization that was very different. And I, I don't know, because we've been really new to the nonprofit piece, but it seems to me the amount, a lot through what Nanette has been able to connect us with, but the network within the nonprofits is fabulous. And for something like what we're trying to do, that's where we're, our strength is going to be how many partners we have that are both funder partners, but also collaborative partners, um, a lot of which are nonprofits local and larger. Uh, but it seems like when there is a Zoom meeting you can get on and there's 10 other nonprofit people and they tell their story and they give you some ideas 
it seems to be much like education where it's a sharing environment. I'm not going to keep my thing secret because you and I are competing. It's a, we're one big family because like you said, everybody has the same purpose of helping in some way, so. And I'll ask one more thing, sorry. I just think when, when funders realized, personal people, don't, individual donors realized that it may not be a financial crisis for them, that also helped loosen the environment for people to call. So no one knew in the beginning. I mean, we all felt like, is this gonna be financial for everyone? What is this gonna look like? But, you know, good, bad, and different, for those who are your top donors, mostly this was not a financial crisis. There were a lot of other crises that might have hit them. And when we realized as, as organizations that it was now okay, I think that that, that helped. I don't know, Robin, did you have? I'm, I'm sorry, Heather. Okay. Robin's hope, I forgive me. I know, I know your name. Of course I know your name. I should just answer to it. Just answer to that. So what, I, what we found at Robin's Hope, we started out fairly small, uh, June of 2000. 18 and you know we had two people show up well for us that's a win um, and it continued to evolve um, over time and we were in a small space in like an upstairs small space and we were just doing what we could to get by and the numbers began to grow to the point where you know it's got 20 people like nearly standing room only and we're debating okay well what are we going to do? How are we going to make this work? And they, uh, we decided to open up a second day. So because we only had one in particular that time. So then we do a second day. And to be quite honest, it was pretty overwhelming uh, just to be on all that time uh, and not really getting much of a break. And so I was kind of getting worn thin. And then the pandemic happened. <laughs> and like you said, the 30 days. 30, yeah, roughly around that time, I felt like I got some rest. Right. Um, but we didn't stop what we were doing. Like, the moment we heard about this happening and we were going to have to close up the office, we immediately looked at opportunities like Zoom. I didn't, I didn't know anything about Zoom. Well, right, right? Yeah. <laughs> Most people didn't know the word, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but how do we get straight, like, how do we get it connected so that before we close our doors, people have an idea of how to connect with us. Um, and from there, you know, at that point, we had we, we calculate like by opportunities of hope, resilience, and connection, and that was like maybe close to a thousand. When the pandemic happened, and over up to this point, it's more than five thousand. Close, it's working towards six thousand right now. We went from two days a week to seven days a week. Um, it was it worked out actually worked out very well for me because I can do that better than I can uh, being in person uh, for that length of time. And it was an opportunity for people to feel connected in the midst of that distance and loneliness. Um, so while. I mean, we, we're thankful in our organization that you know, the primary nonprofit is Jeremiah Foundation, uh, but it breaks down into Robin's Hope and Inner Touch. Inner Touch is a clinical-based program, and Robin's Hope is peer-based, and what we call that is the lived and learned experience. You bring them those two together, and it's offering a even more foundation for this person to find what they need and get the help that they need to move forward. Um, and when we started, we started with funding from InterTouch uh, through, you know, insurance and stuff like that. And that held us for a while. But like I said, when the pandemic came, it was getting really tough. Um, we went back to Zoom. That kind of helped us because we didn't necessarily uh, need extra space. But then midway through this year, uh, we knew that as we were going to open up, we were going to need a larger space and a more accessible space. Um, and we had some, we got some funding through the uh, uh, COVID uh, stuff um, in the beginning. So there was the loans and such, and that was manageable for us, and it helped us, and we were able to get into a new place. But that's not sustainable, right. and that's a big part of it. And in peer-run communities um, in previous years, it's been more about the funding they get from the state rather than the funding they're getting in the community. And 
that's where we want to change that. Um, because, yeah, I, can, I don't want to be reliant on the state or uh, governments to be able to provide a service. Uh, because I don't know if that's going to continue. But if I'm involved in the community and I'm working together with the community, then it can be as sustainable as it needs to be for as long as it needs to be. Thank you. So, Karen, how about what was your perception? What did you guys see where you, at your location? Especially mental health is kind of a tough one. Anyway, now the rest of the world is experiencing what your people are doing already. Absolutely. Um, so I'm thinking back. The beginning of COVID seems so long ago, but it seems like yesterday <laughs> at the same time. Yes. Um, but we, um, so at Richmond Behavioral Health Authority, we serve about 13,000 people every year, um, both children and adults. Um, about 30% are children under the age of 18, and so um, schools shut down. We had to close down the offices for in-person. Um, we started um, just immediately. I mean, I just think um, the, the employees and, and leadership there just moved mountains in just a couple of weeks to, to continue with services um, for all the folks in the city who needed them. Um, COVID just kind of uh, amplified um, the mental health needs, um, and it amplified substance use in the community. Um, folks who had never experienced mental health issues um, were starting to feel it, um, depression and anxiety and, and what's coming next. And um, like we talked about, is it, is it going to be a financial crisis for all of us? Um, are we going to keep our jobs? Are we going to um, move out of this anytime soon? So we, um, you know, as an agency, we lost a tremendous amount of revenue um, because moving into the transitional to telehealth and telemed, um, a lot of, most of our revenue um, on the authority side comes from Medicaid billing. Um, and so when you can't bill for as much time, um, but you have to still see the same amount of people, if not more, um, became very challenging. So we, um, from the foundation perspective, started, you know, what, um, you know, cash money um, did not come easily, those months, first months of, of the, pandemic and so we were thinking about how to um, because people were reaching out how can we help what can we do um, so the, the really great thing that we experienced was a lot of community um, involvement through what we call DIY volunteer projects um, so it's resources it was food it was um, cloth masks I mean in the beginning you couldn't purchase a mask anywhere um, and we had staff who were still we have homeless services programs and intensive community-based treatment who were still going out in the community um, many of the folks that we serve are the most vulnerable in the community um, because of their mental health and their substance use and their living conditions and um, within the first month I think we had 900 handmade cloth masks donated to our organization which was fantastic um, so from there we went into hygiene kits and nourishment kits and cold weather item kits and we were just overwhelmed with the response from the community um, just families were at home kids were at home with their parents working from home and you know what do we do with these kids <laughs> in our space and um, so these DIY kits were a great way for um, families and neighbors to come together and and support the folks that really needed some basic needs support um, during the, the pandemic and, and we're continuing that now um, into this fall because people have really enjoyed being able to do that and make the connection. Um, so while we still can't have face-to-face -face volunteering with, with the folks in our organization um, because of COVID, um, that's been one way that we've been able to address it. Okay, thank I you. just got a report before we started this that said the U.S. has hit an all-time high drug overdose. Yeah. And yeah. it just speaks to that and every other nonprofit could almost probably across the board say the need for their services just went up drastically. Yeah. And that's not ending. Like, we're not going to come down because we're not wearing a mask right now. And that actually is the point I wanted to cover with mm -hmm. what you were saying is, yes, there was an initial uh, shock, mm -hmm. but it's, the, it's continuing, it's continuing, it's mm -hmm. continuing. Um, the pandemic in and of itself is a trauma for everybody. Yes. Um, and that unknown that continues, that constant need to pivot, 
is an extreme stress on both our mind and our bodies. And uh, being able to have a purpose, mm -hmm. a way to give back, or connection in some way while you may not be there face to face, it's just so powerful and, yeah, right in line with what you're saying. One of the things, we're going to get to Chris from an operational standpoint for a second, but i got to go back to our friend Stephanie Beck, or as I call her superhero name, Steph Beck. Um, <laughs> I asked her one time, Hi, like, how you doing? And please explain that, the response that you gave to me that lasted a lifetime. So you ask the parent how they doing and what happens. I guess it all depends on what parent you ask, but... Um, you know, I think the first time you asked me that, um, I went, I think I did surprise you with the response. Which, yes. Which was, um, I don't think you really want to know. That's not, <laughs> that is not a question. So good as thing. a parent with somebody that you know with kids yeah. who has an issue, things are going on in their world, I'm going along with my life, how you doing, that's a Pandora's box. It is. Um, depending on how honest they are, the, the reality is people don't want to know how you're really doing. Because life as a parent today is hard. Um, in, that, in our world with Better Together and, and Medically Complex Kids, um, that is a question that you just don't ask. It's how are things going today or in what ways are you being successful today? Um, but, but asking people how they're doing is, is just a, it is a Pandora's box, like you said, of, of a hot mess. And <laughs> not, not the answer that you want because they're not going to say fine. I have learned in this role when I have asked parents, how are you doing? I never get fine because they're not. They're not fine. They are challenged beyond what they sometimes feel their threshold is. Um, and I think, you know, from what I've heard today, it's been really interesting. And Carolyn shed some really um, great insights. You know, what we do is, um, is sort of the medical side of, of what you guys are describing on the behavioral health side. So. Um, these the families that we support in, in the pandemic related is um, Nanette, Nanette said it. I mean, uh, our, our families are among the hardest hit. You imagine having a child whose life depends on medication and access to health care, and if that's cut off, then you're, you're struggling to keep your child alive, you know? Cool. It, a virtual, a telehealth appointment with your child's, you know, um, endocrinologist uh, is not going to work. Not, not having access to medical supplies. That's not an option for these families, but that became their reality. And as the only organization that provides non-medical support to medically complex kids and their families, they looked to us and said, can you find skilled nursing that can come to our house to help take care of my my kid that needs help 24 hours a day. You know, so our challenges, uh, our role became to help meet their challenges, um, just like so many did. We, we stopped what we were doing a little bit, but um, I even love... Even you said, though, like some couldn't even get um, Instacart appointments, so you went yeah. for groceries, like something that doesn't even fit into yep. your purview necessarily, but yep. they couldn't even get their groceries. Because... Well, I mean, they were losing their jobs the way so many other people were, um, but when you've got a stack of medical bills and you've got the cost of um, medical supplies and many other uh, supports for your child that are not covered by insurance, um, there's, there's a lot of challenges ahead of you. And I, I know one of the things we did, I never thought we would be having grocery shoppers for our families. But they can't go into the store and risk exposure. Um, we are talking about a population of kids that are highly immunocompromised. They can't even go into a food pantry to pick up food for risk of exposure. So when they came to us and said, we need help getting food, I thought, you've got to be kidding. I can't believe this is the direction we're going. Um, the outpouring of community support for us as well was tremendous. Um, when people said, how can you support us, it was grocery gift cards. And can you go get the groceries and then deliver to this address? Um, can you help? And you know, the other thing that we, we were all going after the Lysol wipes and the Clorox spray, <laughs> and we were like sanitizing our house. Well, guess what? A lot of these kids are what we call tech dependent. Their, their lives depend on technology to keep them alive. 
Um, so when I'm wiping down my, my doorknobs and tables with Clorox wipes, they needed those supplies to clean equipment that keeps their kids alive. And without that, hmm. you know, you risk infection and, well, where are they going to go? It's tough going to the hospital with these kids. So this was a, was, um, we, we don't even talk about the behavior side of Carrie for a child with medical complexity. They had to put that on the back burner, quite frankly, because the literal life of their child depended on how they operated on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Better Together, you know, was able to meet a lot of those challenges with community support. Um, I think it helped that we, we were able to tell, tell our story, like Nanette said, and people recognized, okay, in the landscape of those suffering right now, here's a population that's really struggling, that is the target of, of a compromised life in this situation, but we also provided so many ways people could help, and it wasn't just financial, where I'm going to turn your check away, but, um, you know, it was also the groceries, the gas, like gas cards. It was um, lots of different things like that, so. Well, really quick. So we're going to, Chris Mayfield, but really, I, I just want to touch on, on Dustin and you doing business. You come from a military family. Let's talk about what it means to support something like we're doing here. Why is it important? And that's Bankers Life. You've got to get a shout out to Bankers Life and Dustin Yancey. I guess just the greater good. I mean, I've always thought, like, I have a father, but he's a soldier. I mean, my dad's been in the military for 39 years. He's been a soldier to protect this country. When he retires, he'll be a dad. So with this job, it's, it's very, I guess, similar. Like, if I can get someone that doesn't have additional benefits, give them something, then help them and change their lives, get food, get meals, get open, uh, over-the-counter benefits, like, it literally changes their life. They're like, this is great. Um, the, 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 one of the hiccups is, is, for me, is, like, the further you, you move or go away from population, the lesser the benefits, which I think it should be equally across the board, but I'm not the person in charge of that. But I, I can't change it. I can probably complain enough and maybe something might happen. But stuff is getting better and and it is changing. Um, but I always like to think of stuff as like be the tip of the spear. Like if you if this is hitting you, like sit back, figure out a solution to this problem and then address it. But sometimes you can't fix it right there on the spot, like you have to go brainstorm and kind of figure it out and Rome won't built in a day, but it's still there. So with y'all, uh, everything that y'all are doing is it's truly eye-opening to me and I, I appreciate every one of you for what you are doing. So anything I can do to help, just ask and shout out to bankers for having me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to stop. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, so, uh, you know, <clears throat> one of the, the common themes across everybody today is we really didn't see that one coming, or at least we didn't see it coming to that degree. And so, from a, you know, I'm a process guy, a, a business process guy, so um, what, that, what that tells me is we have a great opportunity to really kind of crystallize our lessons learned uh, and then take those lessons learned, uh, make them into uh, a threat inside your SWOT analysis of your organization and then start to discover ways that, that we can mitigate those threats should something like this ever happen again, and it will. Uh, it's just a matter of time. Uh, you know, we might think this is a once in a century or what, we don't, but but we don't know. So, uh, you know, I think the way we build resiliency for you is expanding your casting a wider net, I guess, uh, and and that's what we're doing is, is trying to get you in front of as many um, business owners who, uh, in some cases, most cases, will have the ability, even if it's in some small way. Yeah, I'm going to get your groceries bagged up for you. I'm going to uh, do all those things that you need to get done. Uh, but the more businesses we can, can reach out to, the better uh, you will be. So what I would encourage you over the next, from now until the end of time, 
uh, is engage with one new business owner every single week. Uh, and whether that person ends up being uh, a, a donor today, uh, you don't know uh, what they're going to be able to do for you uh, in, in the future. You know, my, for my business, right, my, my goal is to go out and, and meet uh, a potential client or a, a referral partner, at least one every day. Uh, and that's my goal. Sometimes I get there, sometimes I don't. Uh, but I understand that the bigger the, the net, uh, the more successful I'm going to be. Uh, and I never know who is going to uh, be that next rock star for me. Uh, and so uh, operationally, uh, I would make a development plan. Uh, you know, now have identified your weaknesses in your organizations. How are you going to mitigate those going forward? Should this be a repeat? Uh, we don't know if there's a you know a, a zebra uh, version of COVID coming out. We could go through this for 24 more times with different variations of this virus, and we're going to be back in the same spot every time unless we do something different. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think broadening that net and talking to more people uh, without the expectation of that that they're going to give you something today uh, and figure out what value, uh, what your value proposition is for them, uh, why should they care uh, about what you have to say. Uh, so from an operational standpoint, I think that's building resiliency into your plan and, and really evaluating the last 18, 12, 18 months uh, is going to, to make hay for you down the road, uh, add a little consistency to your donations, uh, and have a, a much stronger lifeline when you do have to throw it out there. Maybe you can make those threats promises to yourself, too. What are those sure. threats promises to make sure they don't happen? Because I do believe that that crisis will hit again, maybe, hopefully not in this capacity. The other thing you mentioned, Chris, was getting out and meeting people. And most people don't realize of the philanthropy that's given this country every year, just under 70% of that comes from individuals. Mm -hmm. So, so many nonprofits, rightfully so, focus on foundations and businesses and, and, and sponsorship. But if you're not building your donor base, your individual, and business owners, I, you know, come under that because those are individuals, um, then you're, you're missing a huge part of the opportunity. And so uh, meeting people every single day or once a week or put it on your calendar to continue to expand your net is so, so important. And I've been in organizations where there was no time to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's the sad thing is down the road when I need, like I said in the beginning, when I need to call somebody and say, we are in crisis. We've got to provide food to these, or, or gas cards or, or groceries to our constituents. Didn't think we would, and it's not in our budget. And now we're not collecting money. What are we going to do? I hope that every organization will have that friend or friends that understand you well enough and you have stayed in touch and you have stewarded them all through the process through your relationship so that you don't even feel bad. You don't even feel like you're asking them for a big chunk of money. But they will rise to the occasion, and they have. I've yeah. been involved in organizations that ask people to double and triple their annual um, uh, annual donations at five and six figures, and people did. People mm -hmm. came to the table to support our community. So. Oh, and, and it's the small, the smaller supporters too. I, I can remember I uh, I support the Chesterfield Food Bank quite a bit, and when the uh, I, I went to visit and do some work, and they had literally had lines of cars miles, uh, two deep, miles long, uh, and. <clears throat> So I went home that night, uh, it was probably about 1 o'clock in the morning, and I made a short video uh, and said, hey, you know, Chesterfield Food Bank, send me a dollar, send me a mask, send me a pair of gloves, whatever you have, here's the address, put it in an envelope, send it to me. I sent this email out at 2 o'clock in the morning, short video, uh, much better than a text email, by the way, <laughs> true, uh, true. to get a lot more response. Short video, 2 o'clock in the morning. We got thousands of dollars in donations. We got masks. We got gloves. Uh, you name it. The supplies started coming in, uh, but it was those individuals that responded. So use your network uh, to the greatest extent that you can, and don't be afraid to ask people for money. Well, that's the thing. The number one reason people don't give to your organizations because you don't yeah. ask, <laughs> and number two through forever are because you didn't make them feel good about their donation or that you were using their money 
in a wise way all those reasons about their personal feelings about their donation. So if you think about that you need to ask and you need to keep them informed and keep them as a, as a friend, as a confidant to the organization, you're going to keep a donor. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the key. And, and things like Chris did for the food bank, people want it. Um, to step up. You know, even people who are your clients, who are people you serve, who may or may not be financially challenged, want to help. So they could make masks. Like you, you know, they can give a dollar, they can give a canned good out of their pantry. People want to want to be a part of this community. Most people don't want to be just the takers. The, ta the people who need the services want to also be the givers too. To point out, um, that's something that we saw at Robin's Hope. Um, the only, I think, issue for us is we were we don't really have a lot of education behind nonprofit or what we right, need. Right. We get that foundation going. But we were so grateful because the community we have developed became a part of making Robin's Hope, you know, take those next steps to be where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. um, so now it's just like like you said, that getting the those foundational pieces. One other thing, so as we, as we move this along, I can think about what, what you talked about. So I grew up, my father always owned his own businesses. And, you know, when you go in as a person, on Monday the swim team comes, on Tuesday the dance team comes, on Wednesday, so he gives here, he gives there, Wednesday you give, well, Thursday the person comes along, the money's gone. I thought you, were, I thought you guys liked the community. They don't know that people had beat you there. What you guys were talking to you about is, be the person that they go under the mattress to get the money. That's the group to be. I don't have any money for you guys, but I got money for you. And so that's what we're talking about. How do we do that? How do we help you become that person? It's about letting your voice be heard. That's why we do these. That's why we get everyone in the room. And the magic happens. This is something people want to give, but they don't know if you don't ask them. And so you have to let people know what you guys do. We live at a time now it's about letting people know. It's not the old days of you have a diary, you write in it, you lock it, put it under the bed, <laughs> go on, go on. You can't survive like that. The world has gotten a lot smaller with technology. We don't have to have people just right here who care about Robin's Hope. Some, some are nonprofits, they're things that touch your heart. Other ones, it may be a touchy subject. Domestic violence may be one, substance abuse. Everybody may not feel that. But what we help you do here from Chris, from the uh, operational standpoint, and that with the uh, financial side, we have Dustin with Banker's Life. My thing is how to get the media to pay attention to you. And you don't have money. Nonprofits are notorious for, we ain't got no money. <laughs> well, well could, you, could you let us get some airtime, TV, radio, whatever it is. That's what we do here. We provide airtime for you. We're going to shoot a video for you that's going to air on the station on ESPN Richmond, we're going to play that to show you guys some exposure. But what we're also doing is, you have to create a relationship with TV stations. WTVR has, they're great with Virginia This Morning. Uh, that's an hour of free TV every morning that they have to fill up. The thing is, how do you get on there? Because you need to do that months in advance. And we can sort of help you with the idea of how do you, how do you make that happen? Because they have, a thousand PSAs right now with everything is a good thing. Okay, whether it's any of the TV stations, the radio stations, they all have PSAs to sit in there. They can't run all of them. So what we do is we try and help you get exposure. And as we're talking, we tag someone from the media, and maybe that way all of a sudden, out of a thousand, all of a sudden, they get to know your organization. Because all it takes is one person, because the media is lazy. They know one or two people, and every time we need a question answered, we run right to them. What we try and do is make you one of the ones that they go to. So one of the things I always talk about here is, and people know me, is what gives you hope. So, so Dustin, we're going to start off with you. You know, young guys, they have a lot of hope. Lots they, of hope. They got a lot of hope. They haven't been beaten. They're, they're right, but his dad is a soldier, so you said you, you weren't raised by dad. Yeah, it was a soldier. That, yeah, that's not his fault. But it's not. I'm, 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 you're, you're, you I understand. Yourself. Me and my wife in our household, that's the way it runs. It's a military household. We didn't want to admit it, but in reality... That you were slightly brainwashed? Yes. We, <laughs> bought, we drank the Kool-Aid, and, you know, there are rules. So, what gives you hope as a young guy out here, as a young business owner, who's willing to do something like this? 
I mean, it, it's the greater good. I mean, at the end of the day, you set your side or set yourself aside when you're a parent. So if you can look at business in the same aspect where you're helping uh, achieve a greater good in the community, and me and my community is the whole state. You know, I'm not just dialed into one area. Um, I'm all over the place. But if it's one person relation, and then that trickles to meeting some other folks, or in this aspect, this is going to be more a bigger reach in the community base. Um, I mean, that's what we're here to. We're we're a hope dealer. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's right. that's <laughs> what we're here to do. Take your turn. Didn't you? <laughs> so, so. One, one of the, since you brought it up, one of the uh, uh, things that, uh, for the Hope Dealer community, uh, you're, you, He's created you a Hope Dealer community. The Hope Dealer there are people out there who, who understand and deal with that. You uh, sort of brought the people together. One of the, the things, uh, what makes it so remarkable is, and gives it the stickiness, is earlier somebody said, well, there's a lot of competition for, for resources, and, and that's absolutely true, but you aren't competition you, you are in competition with each other so you should learn from each other but also one of the things that I do is every day uh, I recognize somebody inside the business community who's supporting nonprofits and then they nominate the next person then they nominate the next person and it's that appreciation uh, and acknowledgement uh, that so many people crave so if you uh, see uh, some something in social media from one of your peer organizations or one of your donors, repost it, share it, and say, here's why this is important. This, this is why I love this person. This is why this organization is great. So don't just like it. Share it and say why you're sharing it. And you will find I shared uh, the last Hope Dealer. Uh, within 24 hours, I had 514 views. Uh, imagine how many views went from my post to her website. It's, it's powerful, uh, but only if you share it and say why you're sharing it. So do that every day, uh, and you you will build your network quickly. Carolyn, what gives you hope? A lot of things. Yeah, um, I'm glad. Yeah, it's. Um, I think what I've already talked about: the community wanting to help, um, the community reaching out and providing resources to folks who need help. Um, I think um, what you pointed out about the overdose rate is climbing, um, but what gives me hope is that there are people seeking treatment and recovering every day um, from substance use and from mental health. Um, so that gives me hope that people are still um, coming in for treatment and asking for help. Um, you know, I think um, I'm going to build on what you said about nonprofits collaborating together. Um, we did see that um, during this pandemic, um, supporting each other um, when when needs were stretched all over the place. Um, so so that gives me hope that nonprofits aren't competing with each other all the time, but supporting each other because we are serving the same people and we have the same ultimate goals is to help our community. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a lot of things give me hope. Yeah. Yeah. This gives me hope. <laughs> this is fabulous. This Pearl's nutrition drink is fabulous. Chris Mayfield was truly happy when I said we were going healthy this morning. Yeah, this is for real. And I, I have hope from, from my dad. I, I feel you, man. I was being uh, okay. No, I think um, I, we can't help but echo the sentiments of collaboration. But I think recently, um, what has stood out in my mind, uh, and today in addition to my beverage, is the, um, I am so excited when I see the investment in the nonprofit community by businesses and business leaders like Chris Mayfield, like Mike King, like Nanette Shore, who is, helps lead a, a, a nonprofit chat to build collaboration. But I've, I've had the unique opportunity, I feel like, to really meet some key people. Jimmy Comer with RBI. These people are making an investment in what they know to be true, which is the nonprofits are what make our community successful and bring hope to the people that need it, that lack the ability or the means to support themselves or serve that particular niche. So um, 
I have to thank you guys because you guys are the hope dealers for us. You guys invest in our community and help make us better, which is going to make, make everybody better. And when I meet one more new person per day that says, gosh, what you're doing matters, and let me weave philanthropic you know, community outreach into the fabric of my business, that gives me hope. Really quickly, I know Emmanuel's going to start to meet the, the hand signals about the time. But, Stephanie, let me ask you, how, how do you go from, and the emotion to go from, a child who's really sick, that you start better together, and he's going to dances and stuff with flannel shirts on? <laughs> let's, let's talk, if people don't think that social media works, Tell okay, you what. what is that feeling like? Do you feel like, boy, that was a long time ago, but in reality it, it was. It was yesterday. It was yesterday, yeah. When my son was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer and, and the journey that we went through, um, and then watching him come out on the other side, you know, there is such a sense of thankfulness um, and gratefulness, and it's not only uh, to his medical team, but really it was our community that pulled us through, that navigated this journey with us, and I feel like it was the battle of a lifetime. Um, and every day and every year that we get to say that's one more year in, in remission um, is just... It's another trophy on the shelf for him and his ability to live a successful um, and healthy life. And I feel like it was, I feel like we've won a race. You know, it was a marathon and I feel like we've run a race. But yet, you know, what it does more than anything, when I wake up in the morning, that is my perspective that it didn't have to end that way. Oh. And for many people, they don't have an end in sight. We had July 26th as an end date to treatment. So many people don't have an end date. It is a lifelong challenge. And my, I am grateful for the situation. People are like, you're glad your kid had cancer? No, I'm not glad he had <laughs> cancer. I'm glad for the perspective that I now have on life and what it does for me and my motivation to give back. The team at Robin, so yes. now that, it's in your name. Yes. <laughs> it's in your name. What gives you guys hope? Well, with Robin's Hope, uh, and originally as a co-founder, it was built out of, I started it out of my own need. Like, I needed connection. I needed other people who got it, who were, we could share ideas with and uh, come up with other healthier ways to do, so, do different things and to build my life. I just needed to see it happen. Like, once I have the instructions to get to where I want to go, that's what I want to do. And that's what I've seen at Robin's Hope. And what gives me hope is each person that walks through, whether it's in-person or virtual doors, um, that they are making a commitment for themselves. And how powerful that commitment for themselves has to do with the community. Because what they are developing within themselves is going out into the community in, in its own way. And that gives me hope. Okay, we ain't gonna start crying. Now see, <laughs> there was that one right there as I said, the okay, <laughs> we're going on, the gym team. No, the gym. <laughs> hey, see, why did you even want to say that? I went right down there with you, trying to be a, a delinquent. Yes. Um, I think what gives me hope, I've had the fortunate, fortunate opportunity for 35 years to work in education and work where at the end of every day I felt like I've done something to help somebody else. Um, to roll that energy and that synergy over to nonprofits, to see it, what it's shown me is the way nonprofits work and the things that they do, especially in the climate that we've had, there is so much good in the world um, that's still there. And the synergy that happens as you get ideas and good people working toward helping others. Um, it does as much for us as it does for those that we're helping. Okay. Ned, take us home. I'll take us home. Well, a lot of things, but mostly the people who are boots on the ground, willing to put their, their time and effort and resources and um, take those adversarial situations and turn them into something so positive. And I can read from afar your bracelet says Ignite Hope. So yes. we're hope dealers who ignite hope. Mm -hmm. But everyone who works in this profession doesn't do it because 
They're going to climb the corporate ladder. They're doing it because they deeply care about the community. And some adversary, look, I've been through adversarial situations in my life. I wouldn't say I wanted to go through them, but boy, coming out the other side, I can say I learned so much and it changed who I was as a person that I don't want to give that part up. So I totally get yeah. what you're saying, but those out there really fighting this fight for those who can't or those who don't or those who won't. And so I just, I think this community of people who are out there willing to take this on as a profession, as their life work, um, that's what gives me hope. All righty. Uh, we'd like to thank you guys for coming. Uh, one of the things I want to say is go over really quickly. I'd like to thank uh, Chef Michelle Wilson, Mama Michelle's Cafe, for having us here. Okay, you can find her. That is uh, The Culture Mix is the name of her TV show. It is on Taste on TV. Make sure you come to the cafe. It's starting to open back up after COVID. She's still standing. Uh, like a lot of businesses are, and that's celebration. You can catch her on ESPN Richmond with me from time to time, talking about the culture mix. Chris Mayfield, you find him? Yes, Emmanuel, I see the time, sir. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Chris Mayfield, Thursdays at uh, 6 a.m. That's where you find the next shore. She kicks off Monday with us, 6 a.m. So what we do is we talk about how business can help society be better. Once again, I'd like to thank my friends at the Foreign Exchange. That's why I'm rocking this. Standing next to a man who's looking like a model. But I'm doing this for you guys for the Foreign Exchange, as well as uh, Jay Carpenter with Family Watches. Got to give a shout out to my man. That's how we keep this thing going. But we'd like to thank you guys for tuning in. This is going to drop soon. And uh, we'd, oh, we'd like to thank Emmanuel from DDRK. Yay. If you ever need okay. video done, get it done right. Emmanuel from DBRK. That is the letter D, letter B, arcade like the video games. Mm -hmm. DBRK, they're the best of business. I love rocking with them. Uh, Dustin? Dustin, Man one last time. Dustin Yancey, Banker's Life. You thought I forgot. No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but Banker's Life, you need to talk to him and get your life right uh, as, you move in, <laughs> as you move into retirement. <laughs> Good enough. That is true. All right, Mike King, Chris Mayfield, Chef Michelle Wilson, and that's sure. We'd like to thank you guys for coming. We're out. We're done. See you. Thank you. <laughs>